appreciate your time. Signal from the producer here. Okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, we are now live uh, with our live stream, and this is the Anderson Forum for Progressive Theology, AFPT. And this is a group that's been in existence for 60 years, and for some time now, we have had to discontinue our in person meetings for the sake of the COVID. But this is our first meeting where we're back together in person. And this is a very uh, important day for us to be able to return to that uh, format. We've had a number of Zoom conferences and other kinds of remote uh, experiences, uh, all of which have been good, but it's not quite the same as being able to be here together uh, to see people we know. Uh, I, had a friend walk up, and I hadn't seen him. How long have I not seen you, John Simmons? It's five years? I don't know. And uh, here he is walking in to hear the speaker. So it's great to remake those acquaintances, uh, to connect, and it's, uh, it's certainly much better than just watching on our screen at home. I'm going to let uh, Steve Morgan, who's the chair of our group, begin our uh, session today with a few announcements and then I'll come back and introduce our speaker and we'll have plenty of time for him to speak and have your questions. So, Steve. Thank you so much, Stuart. I'm going to present the books that are for sale in the, uh, the room just down the hall. There are three books for sale. Each one is $20 written by our present our lecture today. One is about the gospel of Mark and what was going on in the world among the Christian community and in Israel with the destruction of the temple and comparing it to what's going on in the world today, rereading the gospel of Mark amidst loss and trauma in our world today. And then this translation and, and expansion, shall I say, of the New Testament, which includes, according to the author, the books that should perhaps have been included, including the Gospel of Thomas, the first book of the Odes of Solomon, the Thunder Perfect Mind, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Truth, and a, a number of other volumes so that this is, they consider, a complete New Testament that tells a more complete story. And then the main book that we are dealing with today, the subject matter is the 200-year period of time after the death of Jesus and before there were Christians or before Christianity. What happened during that period of time? Uh, th this is at a disc discounted price of $20. Finally, we are presenting this weekend in collaboration with, in partnership with, the West Star Institute which sponsors research projects with academic scholars in the field of re religion, such as, and they created the Jesus Seminar and the recent Christianity Seminar, which produced this book that I've just mentioned. It does so by bringing scholars together to work in an, the unusual way of working together collaboratively as opposed to everybody doing his or her own thing. 
and then they offer scholarships to groups like ours. I invite you to move forward so that you can see the screen because there is going to be printed subject matter and there's plenty of space up front. Thank you, Stuart. Um, we are happy today to uh, have with us Hal Tossi. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Yes. Okay. He is a retired professor, United Methodist pastor, and he's continuing, obviously, his work post-retirement as a theologian and speaker and writer. And so we're certainly happy to have him with us. He has 15 published books. I won't read all the titles. Steve has just uh, referred to three of those. He's had academic positions, including professor of New Testament and early Christianity at Union Theological Seminary in New York, professor of Christianity at the Recon Reconstructionist Rabbinical College, the Presidential Contract Faculty, Chestnut Hill College, graduate program in holistic spirituality in Ph Philadelphia, and he's been the senior pastor of the Calvary United Methodist Church in Philadelphia and senior pastor of the Chestnut Hill United Methodist Church in Philadelphia. And currently, I think, makes his home in Philadelphia and has come to us from there. Uh, it's wonderful to have such a person in our presence and to uh, enlighten us about uh, the New Testament and the period uh, of its formation after the time of Jesus. But uh, we'll go for about 45 minutes or so. We'll stop. We'll have questions from the group. Uh, lots of chance for dialogue. And then we will reassemble. It's 3 p.m. tomorrow. Is that right? 2 p.m. I'm sorry. 2 p.m. tomorrow here at the same location. And we'll have yet another time that we can listen and, and ask questions. So, Dr. Tosig, we welcome you. And we look forward to what you have to tell us. Thanks so much, Stuart, for your welcome. Uh, it does seem to be a, a pretty overwhelming moment for you all. 60 years um, working on this, um, then giving it up because of COVID, and now you're back together. So thank you so much for, for this invitation to be here at this moment. To think about you at work in this kind of character for 60 years, I'm not sure um, where in the world I have been um, that um, has this kind of tenure. So thank you so much. I've done a lot of things in Europe that thinks it, it's old, but I'm not sure if it's as old as you are. Speaking of old, that's me too. Um, and it's also a privilege to be uh, continuing to go in, in, in work that for me uh, means a, a great deal. Uh, I need to, to be thankful to the, the people at Harper One um, for what they did. Um, when they gave us the contract, um, now almost three years ago, uh, and we were a seminar of 20 people who worked for 10 years um, on this task. They, even though they gave us the contract um, uh, for our institute, uh, they said they've never seen three professors write anything good at all together. So they really, they were sure because of what, what we professors are like um, that, that it would simply be yet another professor fighting with another two professors. We thought that we had quite a bit of experience ourselves with writing for the public. And so it was more than a year simply to put together these 66 papers that we had written 
in a way for the public to understand. And there were long nights trying mainly to think about how can the general public think about these kind of issues. And Harper One um, gave us some kind of weird um, notoriety when the book came out in that they not only said that they actually could understand it, but it, it looked like there are a couple of professors that can write um, for the public. And then finally, there's the trip down here from Philadelphia. I've never been to Anderson. Um, I'm glad to be here now. We've, we've been here, my partner and I, for, for a little bit more than 24 hours. And, and um, it's a, a, a been a, it was a really great trip down the spine of the eastern slope of, of uh, the United States um, and seeing so many beautiful things in the meantime between you all and us. You also get to see the goofy character of historians. And not only historians, but historians that are supposedly talking about a history that's about 2,000 years old. I just want you to get the irony and the goofiness of it all. Uh, so, I mean, just take it slowly and realize that whatever happened 2,000 years ago on mostly the other side of the world cannot be treated as history. If we're good, we get about 10% of what happened. And then after that, that there were so many so many differences, so many differences then and now and then in between for us to put that together into anything coherent is simply wrong. I want you to understand that what I was taught when I was learning my trade both as a pastor and as a professor, my professor said things like this over and over again, and that was, we know this when we were talking about history. So I want to propose a different approach to this today, if you will, and that is for you to know the charade of what's being put before you. Um, that is, that in as much as it's almost impossible to know this, much less put it together, when you hear me do the same stupid thing that my professors did, you, you will catch me, I'm sorry you will catch me, uh, saying, we know that. And just if you would, under, under um, your breath, when I say we know this, could you just say, Hal is probably lying. <laughs> I am really looking forward to talking to you. There are people in this room that I've talked to for 40 or 50 years. Um, and I'm grateful for, for this. I. I'm, I'm grateful for the chance for us to talk together. I will lie less if I hear you more. And I, I want us to, to think that through. And some of you know, because you've been in these rooms that I have been in, that I, in my lectures, I only lecture for 10 minutes. And then I say to the people in the room, now it's your 10 minutes. 
Um, and, and, um, and then we go back and forth 10 minutes at a time for however long we go, go back and forth. Um, I didn't really get the allowance to do that today. I just have to do three lectures in the next 24 hours. Um, but I'm going to ask your tolerance if you would let me every now and then, maybe about every 10 minutes, give you two minutes not to say anything, but to simply think about the 10 minutes we just had before us. And maybe write something down. Because of course at the end of this so-called lecture, I want you to hear what, what you think, what questions you have, and where you have a protest to make. So I'm going to stop you about every 10 minutes, and your job is simply to think back and see what you will write down or keep in your head until it's time for you to talk with me. I'm a religionist. That means that from, for me, that I need to think through how religion makes meaning. And so that means not only I have to think of that, but I have to think of the, us all together as to the strange, exciting, and problematic institution of religion. I'm a religionist. I try to think about that Try to think about where religion is making a fool of us, where it's helping us, and where it's doing something in between. I'm a Christian. Um, I've talked about that question to a, um, a journalist about an hour and a half ago who didn't want me to be a uh, a Christian, and I did say that I actually have been at points in my career as a, as a pastor and as a professor, I have said, I think I better give up Christianity. For in the 1990s, for about five and a half years and maybe a few seconds, I decided that I should call myself a post-Christian, meaning that I couldn't get the Christianity out of me if I tried. But I wasn't really sure of how much good it was doing. So maybe one of you or two of you have had thoughts like that. Um, but I want to tell you that that was a pretty short term of being a post-Christian. If you have um, kind of things you call yourself like that, uh, I'm glad for you in that. But what happened to me towards the end of the 1990s was that um, a lot of other people were abandoning Christianity. That was sometimes good and sometimes bad, I assume. But... Um, there were also people who were claiming that they were the only Christians and that we weren't. I decided that I was going to resign myself as the post-Christian because I didn't like um, the tenor of the larger public, which didn't have a lot of variety to those of us who call ourselves Christians. I'm spiritual. It matters to me what goes on inside us, how we take meaning seriously, how we feel deeply about who we are, who the people next to us are, who God is, and who, how, how, who other beings are in, in this way. So please know that as far as I can tell, 
being spiritual is part of my job and is a privilege of all of us in this room. I'll write the book. So this book um, has turned me on my head, as well as the 20 seminar scholars that had, and as well as the three writers. We had no idea what we were in for. Um, and I am still shaking at what we've learned. In the seven months since the book has come out, I keep bumping into things that I had never gotten to think of before. And basically to think out loud about a period of 200 years, 200 years, that's just a little bit less than what, how long the United States of America has been around. 200 years without the word Christian. The first 200 years without anybody calling themselves a Christian. We get to think now about what that really means, not only for the beginning of a title that many of us carry, but for, for the possibility that, that we now have more or less before us the 200 first years that didn't go like we've been saying. I think of the irony right now, if you would, that, and I'm, and I'm talking mainly about us goofball scholars here in this regard. So what's going on right now is that in the New Testament, the New Testament, there are hundreds of thousands of words. You know how many words say Christian in it? There are three times that the word Christian is used in the entire New Testament. In other words, it's a word that almost everybody didn't know. There are many more words that are in that book that mean a lot, I can tell you. But Christian isn't one of them. So hold on, if you can, for the next several years as we download what that means, that the first 200 years weren't Christian. Now, that's a negative. What I'm really interested in is what was going on in those first 200 years. In other words, I'm not at all saying, hey, too bad there wasn't anything going on in the first 200 years. I'm, wa I'm wanting to say that what if one really big set of things was going on that we've been ignoring because we've been putting Christian on top of it. You understand why I wake up at night afraid of what we've got going. So these three lectures that we have in this 24-hour time together, just want to say a little bit about that. Um, tonight, this afternoon, I'm, I have one topic, and that is, I think, the topic where we can't go forward unless we download it to some extent. And that is Roman state violence through the entire Mediterranean in tension with creativity and resistance by a whole bunch of small groups that one might call Jesus peoples. Jesus peoples who are, because there is so much 
Roman state violence going on to everyone. One of the things that the Jesus peoples were trying to do in those first 200 years is invent a life in the face of violence. Now, today I want to be not so much talking about the book. You can read that one. But I want to talk about the meaning of the book in this larger frame of Christianity and non-Christianity in the 21st century. And the 21st century possibilities for Christianity and the new identities for religion and spirituality in this 21st century. I don't know what your leaders are doing, but it's my understanding that maybe I and another one of my colleagues is coming back in the fall because we have 20 chapters of unbelievable surprise. We'll see. No, if we get to be back in the scoop fall, there won't be any repetition of what we say this time. There's just too much stuff to work on that, that means so much to the general public, no matter whether they're Christian or not. Two minutes of yours. Just think about what we've said so far that you might tell me is what you think about it, what you disagree with, what your questions are. I'd like to say one thing before we get into the body of the talk, and that's a phrase that has come to light. I think it first thought, it first started with Professor uh, Karen King at Harvard, um, uh, one of my best friends, um, and. Uh, and she phrased the term, the master narrative. The master narrative. And what she was trying to say was what we all, biblical scholars, had been basically telling the public for hundreds of years. And the master narrative is this. It's the word we have for the story we tell of what the story of the history of Christianity was. Let me give you the master narrative. It only takes about three sentences. Jesus was a big deal. Jesus knew a lot of things. Jesus healed a lot of people. He was maybe God, probably God. What Jesus said was passed down to his students. But we didn't call them students. We called them disciples because that made them sound better. The word disciple means student. The 12 disciples isn't the 12 big guys. It's the 12 students in the Greek word. Then they um, said exactly 
what Jesus said and taught and did to the bishops. The bishops said it to the next bishops. Until there was creeds in the fourth century that also contained all uh, exactly of the things that Jesus did and said. We can find tens of millions of people who tell the, the master narrative all the time. What, one of the things we tried to do in writing this book was simply to say that the master narrative is false. What is the new reality of the first 200 years without Christianity and the new framework, inventiveness, and diversity of those first two centuries? What else has happened now is that, and this was not because we thought this through or anything, but it turned out that as we were working on those 10 years of writing this book, for the first 200 years, that's not even true. How's lying already? Um, we got only through the first 200 years. And in the middle of that, we, agree, we uh, noticed that there weren't any Christians in it. But we took 10 years, all the time, all of us 20, and um, we didn't get all that far. Um, so, the last 30 years, however, of biblical scholars have been breakthrough 30 years. When we sat down to think about those first 200 years, more or less, what we realized is that the people who had gone before us for the last 30 years we're doing a better job than we'd seen in a long time. Weirdly enough, for us old people, weirdly enough, a whole bunch of them were way younger than we were. But I want you to know that the only reason there's a, our book that some people like already is because for those 30 years, I'm not sure that they'll last, there was really good biblical scholarship. Two minutes. I'll ask our um, helper to, to flip on some things I want to show you. We'll go for about 26 down, but uh, we'll go slowly. You see uh, here, let's make sure that we're on, the, on our right pages. Yes. Thank you. So, has anybody been to Aphrodisias in, in Turkey? No? Thanks. I, I, I encourage you to do this. This is a, uh, an ancient city in current day Turkey, but uh, ancient Greco-Roman times in the first century. It's a big city, um, and in the middle of the big city, between the main temple and the main marketplace is a about two football fields 
worth of art for the public. It's the story of the great glory of Rome. So you see here, you see here the um, upper floor of this two football fields long thing. Across from it, like here, is on the other side, another one here. With all kinds of pictures of the glory of Rome. You know, there are probably a whole bunch of people in the seventh grade in public school who talk about the glory of Rome. I am not. I, this is a farce done by Rome as to what they were up to. And what I want, my, the primary thing I want you to get a slight chance to look at is how violent Rome was. So most of the glories are glorious violence. Next page. Here's another, this isn't at Aphrodisias, but we'll go right back to Aphrodisias. This is a lovely little Gemma Augustea. Just, it's about that big. It's a picture of the world, according to Rome. On the top level, we have Caesar and a bunch of gods who rule the world. Underneath this group of great people and great gods, we have the rest of them. The main word of the rest of them are barbarians, meaning all of the people that Rome conquered in the Mediterranean for over 200 years. So you can look a little bit at them, um, if you will. So basically, these, these, these people, oh, you, these people up here, by the way, in the Greco-Roman world, what, what <laughs> um, if you don't have any clothes on, you're a better person. So, I mean, look at how, much, how many clothes on the, the emperor has. More or less, none. The more genitalia you show off and everything, the better. Down here is kind of a more motley thing. Here, some big thing has either fallen down or is being put up. Most scholars think, or I don't know whether most scholars are, um, a lot of scholars think that this is a crucifix going up. We're going to talk about crucifixes more, but we know that hundreds of thousands of crucifixes were used. Why you got, cru why you got crucified was, according to Roman law, you were trying to overthrow Rome. However, that basically, that probably wasn't happening, but what the soldiers of Rome were told by their, the, those in charge of them was that please go every week into a village somewhere in the Mediterranean. Pick somebody out that looks like they're doing a good job and crucify them. We think probably that this is the person that's going to be crucified. We're not sure. Um, uh, and um, the rest of it, you need to simply say, is this should be barbarian, meaning this should be um, something the, uh, that where people don't know what they're doing. So barbarians really basically means, in Greco-Roman, it means someone who is not quite human. The word barbarian means they're not quite human. So here's the picture of the world. The gods and the people in charge and the barbarians. Let's look at the next picture, please. Thank you. 
Ah, back to aphrodisias. This is one of those big things on, remember the, 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 the two things going for a football field down there? So this is the, this is the um, emperor in, in, you know, as a, as a portrayal of Claudius, a first century em, um, empire, uh, emperor. And uh, he's in a battle. He's leading his armies. And he is, is just finishing off Claudius's um, battle with Britannia. Britannia. This is Britannia. It's not just a person. It's all of Britain. Somebody's cut off. This, this has been not, um, uh, is not complete now. But he has a, uh, uh, Claudius has a, um, probably a sword over his head about to put it down on um, Britannia. But in, before he fi finishes um, uh, doing that, you need to know there's another sign of the way art was done. When the right breast is uncovered, that means that a, a um, nation has been destroyed. So this is the destruction of Britannia by Rome. Look at more carefully and, and hold on to your hat. What, where is Britannia, where is Claudius coming from? He's coming from the rear. This is the story this is what all Roman soldiers have to do. If they find someone in the battle that they're fighting and, 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 they, and they've won. So this means that Claudius has already won but has found Britannia alive still. So what all soldiers, this is, these are real soldiers that he now does in a picture but all soldiers that find someone living in a battle that Rome has won, what they must do, anyone know that? What every winning soldier must do is rape the living soldier. Go to the next one. We're really proud in some weird, pathetic way um, of, that we got this in the book. Um, uh, it's the first, as far as we know, ever for this object to be in a book. Anybody recognize it? If I would say that you, if we would give you 20 minutes, you would, and you would say, we're going to figure this out. You will. So, for instance, here is um, a, the back, the back part of the heel. This is the back part of the heel. Anybody know what this might be? This is a nail. This is a, a part of a cruc crucified heel. This was found in a, 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 in a, 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 something that was dug up and it's still got the metal right through the heel. This is a part of the only known actual 
thing from a crucifixion. It's a real part of a real, real crucifix, or crucifixion. Now hold your hand over your mouth. See, they even have his name. So just to say a little bit more then about um, what we know, how's lying. What we know about um, crucifixions just in the part of, of Israel. During 10 years when Pilate ruled over southern Israel. We know that sort of story, right? Guess how many crucifixions Pilate did in those 10 years? 10,000. He brought, he was so proud of it. At one point, there was a road, you can see this in pictures, um, uh, there was a, a, a road that went for 12 miles and they put, cr they crucified people on both sides of the road for 10 miles. Remember what they do. They just do this every week. Why do they do it? Not because they've caught people at the trying to to um, overthrow Rome, although one wouldn't blame them. It's to scare the death out of them so that no one will think of that. Next picture. I can go on all day long, by the way, on just this stuff. And what's this, what we, I don't know how you are. When do you think back on Sunday school? Nobody taught me any stories about this. Whatever we were learning in Sunday school doesn't know that in those 10 years in Asia Minor, when Pilate was in charge of everything, almost certainly every family in Israel had someone who was crucified. Here, now you know what happened to this um, um, uh, nation of Dakoi. There's Dakoi the down, down here. What happened to the Dakoi, right? I just told you, right? They were, they were um, destroyed by Rome. Right breast unfurled. That's the signal. Let's take one more, I think, right now. So here's uh, our coins um, from, from uh, Israel. Uh, no, really, actually, all over the Mediterranean. Um, and there are tens of thousands of them. Looks kind of neat, I think, frankly. This is another emperor. I mean, that sort of goes, right, with the way you have coins. <laughs> the person in charge is on one side. On the other, it says here, we can almost know this, it says, Judea capta. Judea capta. Judea conquered. It's... It's hard for me to think through this, but that's what they put on the coins. It was, I mean, it's basically we won, right? So you see Judea with the soldier standing over him, holding, in her, holding her head in her hand. 
You can still find these coins in the, in the dirt in all, in all plate, parts of the Mediterranean. Two minutes. One of the things that we tried to do um, as we were finishing up this picture of the 200 years um, was what the six biggest surprises were that we thought we um, uh, had in hand. And again, not because we knew it, but just because the, the, the good younger sc scholars better. One surprise. The Jesus people resisted the Roman Empire. Secondly, one of the main things that the Jesus peoples did was they practiced gender bending. Gender bending. We'll talk about that tomorrow. When the Jesus people lived together, any kinds of Jesus peoples, they, ch they lived in chosen families, meaning they didn't live with their blood family, they lived with each other um, as family, even if you weren't related to each other. Most, almost all, I don't know how many. Most of Jesus' peoples thought that they belonged to the people of Israel, even though their mother and father weren't from Israel. The Jesus' peoples of all different kinds had very diverse kinds of organized being together. There, no one was in charge of the Jesus peoples for the first 200 years. They did different things. They organized themselves in different ways. Again, more tomorrow about what those organizations were. When you look at the Jesus peoples and what they did when they hung out together, hardly any of them, like almost hardly anyone in the entire Mediterranean, they couldn't read or write. So they pr primarily talked to each other without reading or writing. Probably this fall we can talk about that more. A little bit more about crucifixion, if you may. I'm just going to read some Bible passages about crucifixions and what the Bible folks did or thought. Um, uh, first, um, Paul in 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, Paul says, I know nothing but Jesus anointed and crucified. I know nothing but Jesus crucified and anointed. Mark 8, 34. Those who want to follow me, Jesus said, take up a cross. Go 
Galatians 2.20. Paul says, I am crucified with the anointed, and yet I am alive. If you know your Bible, you'll know that there are lots of times in which people talk daily about the experience of crucifixion in their life. I want to talk a, um, a little bit more about the shape of violence by Rome. The main thing they did was they had a really big armies, really big armies. They, they controlled every bit of the Mediterranean basin. From all across North Africa, all the way up Italy, down over to Syria, everything in they, and they controlled it because they had a huge army. I've already talked to you a bit about how that army acted. But it wasn't just army. It was enslavement. So when they went in and, and captured an entire nation, when they went in, they took about 20 to 30 percent of the people they conquered away from their, from their home nation and enslaved them. They made slaves of 20 to 30 percent of the people that they'd conquered, probably after they had, in many cases, raped them. But what happened then was they often would enslave some of the richest, most intelligent and most um, uh, legible um, people so they could come and rule some other nations under Roman control. That is, they needed more people to take over the other nations that they, that they had conquered too. So they made people slaves um, who knew how to run a country. As well as, of course, Rome is famous for making roads everywhere. Guess who, you, who made the roads? All of the, all of the famous um, uh, waterworks of Rome, all around Rome, guess who made them? The slaves. They taxed. They taxed every country that they had destroyed. We know more about, because we've been looking at Bible kind of things, um, we, knew, we know more about how much they taxed Israel. But Israel was one of the poorer countries. They taxed between 20 and 25% of the uh, every year of the income by the population. They displaced many people when, who weren't enslaved because they needed their power someplace else. So Rome needed people someplace else, so they forced them to leave their home and go someplace else and work there. Work there. That's in addition to all the enslaved people. One of the most amazing things was religion, un a violent religion under Rome. One thing they didn't do is they were not interested in um, uh, say, uh, in saying that other people's religion was wrong. They let people's religion 
be there, except everybody every day had to um, make a prayer or take a, make a sacrifice to the emperor. But then, the other thing that Rome did everywhere was the thing that I just showed you about aphrodisias. In so many cities, they came in and made these huge things of honor to Rome. We just, so every, it, it, all a part of your city, you actually get to see the grand history of Rome. Two minutes. I think we'll go for about ten more minutes. Um, I'm I'm behind, but. We'll stop where we can. The thing I want to, to do in this last 10 minutes is to tell you what the Jesus peoples were doing in the middle of this violence. First thing we need to know is they were scared to death. They, like every other destroyed people, were afraid that yet another person in their in their particular family, might get crucified, might get enslaved, might get sent to another country, might be randomly taken um, uh, uh, to, to some place to do something else um, uh, at, the, at Rome's beck and call. So, so um, nevertheless, they uh, were first of all in resistance. They basically, as much as possible, tried to screw up what Rome was doing. Now they had no Ro uh, the the Jesus people had no army. By and large, they had nothing um, to fight back with. And they were scared when there was some fighting back or some fighting by, done um, in their villages. But they basically began to say to themselves, how can we understand who we are in other terms than Roman violence. Actually, these are in our Bibles. What they, te they think to each other. Uh, so for instance, um, here is what um, some of the things in the Gospel of Luke say. When they see soldiers known for killing, beating, and stealing, what Rome says explicitly to the soldiers, no intimidation, no extortion. What I want to know about um, the Gospel of Luke in that case is, weren't they afraid they'd get crucified or thrown in jail? To tax collectors, Luke out loud says, the Gospel of Luke says, collect no more than what you're supposed to. What that means, right? You know what that means, right? They were. The tax collectors were not just collecting taxes at the 20 to 25 percent. They were collecting more for themselves. In view of the poverty and hunger of those under Rome, Luke says, anyone who has a, 
has little clothes and little food, you must give enough. Revelation to John is the angriest about Rome. It says, it, and this is what Re Revelation to John says about um, Rome. You are intoxicated with the blood of the holy ones and the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. Come out, my people, away from her, Rome, meaning come away from Rome, so that you do not share in her crimes. Remember, they do share in their crimes, right? They take people other places in order to do the violence of Rome. Here's what Rome, here's what the revelation to John says is happening right now. Rome is being burned and to suffer the same torture and agony she did to all the nations. That did not happen. Revelation to John just said it did. If you're working on your two minutes, I would say, how would, that, how would that feel to write that, that we, we burned down, we're burning down Rome when we know that they didn't? There was a creativity about this, too, in the Jesus peoples. Inventing a life in the face of violence, caring for one another, feeding one another, finding a future together, forgiving one another. You would have plenty to forgive of one another in a Jesus group, wouldn't you? Because so much violence is going on in so many ways. Here's the, ba ba the basic teaching for the disciples. What are the disciples, they're the students. You are the salt of the earth, the life of the world. Don't fret about your life, what you're going to eat, drink, or wear. Look at the birds of the air. They don't gather into barns. Seek God's domain, justice first, and all these things will come to you. Follow the empire of God, not Rome. I know we, we know all these verses, right? We simply didn't, weren't taught the context. Think about all of this violence and then teaching these. One last little Bible story from the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Luke. I think you may have known this and just thought, I can't understand this story. This is the story of um, Jesus and the, and the students on a boat going across a lake. And they're going to a place where when they get out, there's a man who uh, is in the cemetery. And the cemetery, um, uh, and this man is going crazy in the cemetery. He is basically um, uh, hitting himself with rocks, and then the people in the nearing village are trying to actually tie him down in the, in the cemetery so he won't hurt himself to death by hitting himself with rocks. Jesus uh, comes up in the cemetery, and the man says, um, why are you coming to me? 
And, and the man says, I have, I, something is possessing me. What's possessing you? The, um, something is possessing me and capturing me. And Jesus says, remember this? I bet you don't. Some of you do. Um, Jesus says, I'm going to take those it finally gets out that what is possessing him is a, a legion. What's the word legion mean in English, Greek, and Latin? It's, an, it's a, a, a military unit of 5,000 or of 2,000. So Jesus says, I'll help you get rid of, of the legion that is, in, is capturing you inside. And I'm going to take that legion and throw it into the pigs over on the hill. How many pigs are on the hill? 2,000. 2,000. In other words, now we know in this story that what Jesus finds is a man who is throwing rocks at him to kill himself because the military in town has captured him and captured his insides. Jesus is going to rescue him and throw all of the legion into the pigs. This is a, a really a funny, dark story. How many places in Israel are there 2,000 pigs? No, <laughs> there's no one. That, that doesn't happen on the hillsides. In other words, it's an in. We understand that the legions are on the hills, but in the story, he throws the legion into the pigs. The pigs run off the edge of the cliff and are drowned. And he is free and never sick again. This is what we call the way the, the Jesus people thought through their violence. They knew that all of these people were, so many people were crazy with grief. They knew that Jesus couldn't do anything about it in terms of the legions. But they make up a dirty story in which, at least when you hear the story, you know that it's a story of putting all those soldiers over the edge. Well, I'm going over time. I apologize. Um, um, so let's um, take two minutes and see uh, right now what you want to yell at me about, what you want to ask questions about, what you are feeling.
Christian is a Latin word. It's not a Greek or an Aramaic word, right? It's used in all three languages. I mean, yes. But it would have a specifically Roman <laughs> yeah. soldier context. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. For Aramaic speakers being described in Greek, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. One more minute for your thinking before we go to get together. All right, so you know I lie half the time, and, um, um, and um, you know that the task is overwhelming. I've already told you how, how I can't think of how to get around or get, make sense of all of this, um, and how clear it is that how much is actually in the Bible. Thoughts, questions? Yes, can um, could let's see. How do I? Just, just speak it. Just repeat it. Would you repeat your question for the people on online? Thank you. Um, uh, so the um, second chapter of the book has a, a big, long answer to that. Um, but I want to say a short answer. Um, um, the word Christian is a foreign word that doesn't mean what it thinks. It has nothing to do with religions. Um, at all. Uh, so when we say that, that um, people are talk, taught um, um, uh, uh, that they call themselves Christian, the question is what does that word mean? And that word is a, basically comes from the Greek um, and Hebrew um, um, translation of the word for anointed. Anointed. Um, and and what, what we think is happening is because probably the first document we had that uses that term is by the Rom Romans themselves. And, the, and a, 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 a governor is reporting to the emperor of, about um, how he um, is having to um, uh, punish people who are um, uh, people who are anointed. Crazy. Yeah, right, right, exactly. Um, and it's all laid out in, in chapter two. Um, but what I, what I want us to um, notice is that, so it looks like that what has happened is the governor um, is finding people um, who are in parts of Jesus groups who are also parts of folks 
organizing um, as people who are anointed for a, I mean, the only people that are anointed are government people. Um, in other words, pe these are people who are somehow in a group um, that call by, either by a, probably not Hebrew, but probably Greek word, Christos. Christos. That's what they're saying. Some, the governor has to think about killing someone who thinks of themselves as a Christos, which means an anointed one. They already know of the stories about Jesus being called the anointed one um, and being killed for it. Of yes, of them, of them basically being some kind of group that is using military terms um, for. Resistance. It's, it, it, it looks, and the and the governor is really saying, "Listen, they're not they're not acting like um, enemies." But I, I I I've killed a couple of them, um, but it doesn't really feel right. And the emperor writes back and says, "Yeah, try not to do that." Um, um, but in other words, there is, well, it's like the revelation to John. There are people who use um, military imagination to, to, to stay in relationship to all of the violence that they're experiencing. So that's, that's the short. We have also three or four chapters on that and how that lays out. But the first thing I want to say is it does not mean anything like Christian. It is the, the Greek and, and um, the Greek and Latin word for this strange kind of saying uh, among Jesus people, we are resisting. We're in a group that's resisting. And the Emperor and, and the emperor and the governor already know that that sort of sounds like not a good thing. Maybe we should kill him or something. Um, but the, the governor says, ah, it doesn't really quite look like that, and, and, the, and the emperor agrees. But please read the, uh, if, you, if you only read the Christian, there are only three, again, there are only three times in the entire New Testament that you have the word Christian, and it's in these terms. But we, we did make a real run at it without wanting to, we didn't want to say, listen, Christian means what we think Christian says. But it looks like this is what it might mean. I think, frankly, we're, we may be wrong. talked about the pervasiveness of uh, crucifixion. That's a lot of bodies, all those hundreds of thousands. What, they do, what was the Roman practice of disposition of bodies? Oh, um, uh, um, um, uh, just uh, throw them in the ground. How long? After? As fast as possible. And of course, there you have, yeah, um, for people of Israel, you have a really complicated um, um, dynamic because there you're supposed to um, bury them, bury someone who's died as soon as possible and with prayers. I mean, to have a funeral, not like our funerals, but like theirs. Um, and so one of the tensions between the Romans and the, the uh, people of Israel at that point is um, uh, Rome tries to get them in the ground as quickly as possible. Or John Dominic Crossan also says a lot of them get eaten by birds and dogs. This is hypothetical, just a tremendous question. If this happens around Jerusalem, what about if you throw it on, uh, say, Gehenna trash heap? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, no, that's, there's all kinds of double and triple entendres in all of this because you have so much loss and so much violence going on all the time. You, I mean, like the Mark V story. I mean, I think the Mark V story is, is funny and, and even humorous in a, 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 a gritty kind of way. Mm -hmm. today. And this book and this work really challenges that narrative at the beginning of the narrative. What impact do you think it might have on the subsequent parts of that narrative? It's, it's too hard for me to make sense of what we as Christians are doing at all, much less how that works out. Um, I, think, I think it's really, um, and it's just all, all across the spectrum, um, we're in trouble with how to think about ourselves and how to make sense of who we are and who God is and Jesus. Um, so that's the first Thing I would say about it. Um, I'm, I'm willing to say that um, facing violence in that time uh, is a really good chance that it will change the way we think about our lives in general. In other words, um, uh, so what if, I, I wouldn't want to say, it, it is in fact that the Jesus people are in the depths of, of violence all the time. And um, and that their creativity and their resistance has, has humor in it, has real care of one another in it. Um, we're going to see a lot tomorrow about the way they built groups together because of the violence. So it doesn't seem to me that at least what I would call myself middle class Americans, we don't have much um, practice in being right in the middle of violence. Um, and it looks to me like the character of those first 200 years has everything to do with trying to think through how do we claim a space that is human and caring in the middle of that? I mean, we're, we ourselves are so surrounded by protecting ourselves from so many things. We don't have, I don't think, right now enough experience to look loss and pain in the eyes and come out with something um, that's kind and powerful. Hi. Yeah, hi. I heard a history professor say that in the last couple of weeks talking about the Civil War that the South is the most violent part in the United States because of our history of slavery. Mm. So when you say that we don't know violence, there are people that know violence in our country. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much. And we may not know the violence, yep. but there are people that know that violence. So 
the um, Okay, would you, could you say that again? Can you say that again? Okay. Oh, duh. Sorry. Um, the uh, question, no, the statement was powerful um, that we think that we in the South uh, are in settings where that, that experience is, is happening and has happened in ways that can make sense of who God is and who life is. Did I overstate it? You mean the African Americans? The African American experience, they know violence. Is that what you meant? I was, I was just making the statement that the South is violent according to this professor because of our history of slavery, mm -hmm. because of the fear all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I can say um, with uh, humility and um, fear that my life was changed in this regard because I was um, pastor for uh, 13 years of an African American uh, congregation, and the the amount of loss and violence that I pastored every day changed my whole life. Um, and what I don't want to say is, um, uh, to, I don't want to, to, to say, um, to simplify our race relations on that or get myself out of it. But I do, um, I do think that what you're saying has a lot of, of I, well, the same thing happens to me in my long relationship with Native American people. In as much as we can stand still and be present and have that be our lives in the mix, um, that the Bible has a lot to, to teach us, and so do our lives. Would you like to follow up because that's such a good thing to offer? The South, for the, a big part of the South was settled by the Scotch-Irish, very independent people. And that may have been a part of that slave trading, slave ownership, violence that occurred for how many years in this country? Mm -hmm. Before we were in the country. Yeah, That's thank right. you. Thank you. I hope I've um, said clearly enough that I, I think better when you uh, challenge things that I've, I've said. So please, I, I would want to say challenges on that front can only do us good. where you talk about the Roman violence and how so much of what developed among the Jesus peoples was about how they dealt with violence. The idea of how American slaves dealt with their situations came naturally out of that conversation. Um, and we talked about how American slavery, people in those situations learn to find ways to find joy in life and, and creativity that you mentioned. And we sort of made the connection that the current recognition of the talents and creativity of people of color in our country seem to be coming to the forefront right now. Mm -hmm. um, 
it was a very interesting conversation. The other connection that we made in about in thinking about people in those situations was Ukraine right now, and how those people are being challenged um, with how how do we live amongst all this in in the midst of all this violence mm -hmm. and still find some meaning in life. Mm -hmm. And if I might um, honor you with what you just said, that um, uh, it could be that, that um, we can learn uh, all kinds of things relative to all kinds of um, presence in the midst of violence. Do you think that the violence deepened in their spirituality and actually led to the formation of the uh, uh, formalized the Jesus movement? Or did, it, did it have a positive effect, shall I say? And um, without the violence, what would mm -hmm, happen? Mm -hmm. Great question, Steve. So the, Steve's question was, um, d is there a positive thing that is going on in the facing of Roman violence in everyday life. Um, so I, I'm going to say what I should say last first. Um, my, my book that, that you threw around uh, uh, from the Gospel of Mark um, is about um, loss and trauma. Um, and what, what um, Professor Katrosis and I did when we um, uh, wrote this book is we, in every chapter, we found tons of stories about violence in um, every chapter. As, as we finally put in the Gospel of, the, the Gospel of Mark is so fine-tuned with making the reader see all the broken bodies in the story, not just Jesus's. Almost every, um, every page has a broken body on it. Um, and none of it turns out exactly right. Some of it turns out some right. Um, so that raises for me, a, I, I would want to have a, so I write books like this because I think if we face into violence in the ancient world and in our world, there is um, a kind of humanity that emerges uh, that is um, helpful. I am afraid of ways in which my Christianity um, looks too quickly for too easy answers that make things better. And the way I see the Gospel of Mark especially as its willingness to stay with that and uh, stay with the pain and the loss enough so that the, the human can go deep enough to make real uh, change. Was well, that clear enough? No? Okay. Uh, no, um, sure. That was, yes, okay. Was yes. Uh, you, you've described this 200 year plus or minus years. It, and we're left wondering if that was a period of incubation for what was going to come after that. Um, an organization and an institution called Christianity. Can you speculate what would have happened after Jesus' death had there not been Roman violence? to which these people were responding. 
Well, you've got like three or four thoughts and questions there, John. Um, first of all, I, I want to say um, the, uh, to drill down a little bit more into your question and thought, um, I want to say that by and large, I as a Christian thought that only one person got crucified, or maybe one and plus two, right? Um, but what is clear to me that the Bible wants us to know is that every family had that happen to them. And that the only way for that to get better is for us to take everybody's family on the cross seriously. Um, your next 250 year question later. Um, uh, again, my colleagues who are doing this next 200 years um, uh, aren't finished yet. Uh, but I, I, it, it seems that part of what happened in the fourth century when Constantine became a Christian, so to speak, where, where the doer of violence, the primary doer of violence, became a Christian and didn't change his, and didn't change his behavior. Because what we know is that he crucified and killed people, tons of them, afterwards. Probably not as many Christians. But um, that's that's um, goofy um, uh, as, as a good thing that happened. I, I fear that whatever happened in the Constantinian shift, it, um, it basically um, replaced the picture of these 200 years with the emperor. And that... I don't trust. Um, in other words, to make that into a imperial cult that had so much violence continue. Um, it doesn't seem like whatever the four, first 200 years were working on, and they were different things. Um, I had a I had a, my last thing to do today in this chapter was to say a little bit more about that. But I, I want to say, um, I don't. Th I think that whatever they were cooking on, there was a chance for that to emerge, and I'm not at all sure that there was after the fourth century. And a way that I could be wrong would be to look at how a number of especially Catholic medieval Christians took their experience of violence seriously? By the way, you had 85 people watch online. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions or a comment. Uh, new occasions, Carl uh, Koch says, new occasions teach new duties. Time makes ancient good uncouth, the creeds, etc. They must always um, upward, onward, who would keep abreast of truth. And then Alan Aiken said, um, says, at the, time, at the end of the talk, there was a suggestion that the Jesus people began to act violently, a precise copy of the uh, Roman behavior. How do we know that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Uh, if you could hold on there for make sure that I get most of them. Um, uh, first, last, um, I did not mean to say at all that um, that Jesus people started being violent. It I, wasn't until they got power. <laughs> yeah, I mean, 200 years later, yeah. maybe. But I would want to say what, at least my experience in American settings where people are really 
had so much violence come at them that that it um, that one has to expect um, humor and anger to be a part of processing one's life falling apart because of violence. So that's what I meant to do, uh, meant to be saying. Probably, however, one would have to. I don't know about this, but it seems like that Jesus people and un-Jesus people who have this happen to them under Rome, some of them would go crazy with violence too. What I'm hearing you say is that um, when people are oppressed, they're going to find a way to have happiness and joy somehow. And then when they get the power, if like in South Africa, if they had not had reconciliation sessions, that probably would have been a bloodbath. Mm. They worked hard on not having that. But in other places, when the majority or the ruling class lost, um, the people who were oppressed would act like the ruling class did before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And could, could, would you say one more time one of those other uh, uh, I, let's see. Um, it says, new occasions teach new duties. Time makes ancient good uncouth, the creeds, etc. They must always upward onward who would keep abreast of truth. Well, I would thank someone for saying that and um, ask what else they also can say. I, I, I'm afraid um, I, I can stay here forever, but you all that are in charge should shut me down whenever you want. Uh, don't forget the book sales. They're down the hall along with refreshments. We continue at 2 o'clock tomorrow uh, here, and Hal will be available in the, uh, in, the, in the book sale room to sign copies and to talk with you further. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.